Welcome to the Lone Star Drift YouTube channel. This is Fielding Shredder. He is one of the longest standing drivers in Lone Star Drift. He has about eight years of experience. I think he has a unique perspective on stuff because he's been driving a very aggressive Jay-Z car for five of those years. That uh, can't be right. No, it was more than that. So you must have been an SR car for longer than eight. I feel like you've been around longer than eight years now. It might now. be. It I might can't be even ten. Count that long. Because you were hanging out with me in D1 USA when I was a driver in D1. That was 2009. That was 2009. So yeah, you're so at nine, nine to ten years. Yeah. Okay, I think he's been around for ten years. I always do this too. It gets confusing. <laughs> yeah. I've been driving for 14 years. I have over a thousand days of track experience. You probably have a huge amount. No. Probably not quite that, but no. over 500 because you drive at a rally ranch. Yeah. So I want to talk to him about how he's special how he's been driving this car forever and what it takes to drive something like this and how much time it takes to maintain it and everything. But also, yeah, well, whatever. You'll, <laughs> we'll get I'm, there. I'm just yeah. gonna get out of this in a second. Yeah. I'm just priming the audience. And the second thing is, is he's one of the few drivers in Texas to transition from just a drifter into a full-time racing person, whether that be working for an indie team building a race car. Is that accurate? Close, yeah. I'll, I'll or it. he works at a rally school Training drivers, yep. is that accurate? Driving instructor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's a driving instructor. So this is Fielding. Take it, Fielding. All right. Talk to us. All right, so I guess uh, I'll just kind of go into it. I've been doing this for quite some time now. I, I really love it, and it's you know been the, quite a journey, obviously. A lot of work goes into it. Let's just start with talking about the car. It's a 2J S14 with all the drift goodies on it, suspension and you know, knuckles, steering stuff. Um, the engine's quite a bit of power. It's about 450, 500 horsepower, depending on the day. And then the the car itself, you know, it's got a lot of cool kind of looking parts on it. So full wide body, body kit, um, nice little accents here and there. And that's just been something I've kind of been building up. So style has always been important to me. Uh, whether I had a good taste for style or not in the past, you know, has been developed and you got to you got to definitely make mistakes to know where you can uh, improve. So I think I've got one of the best looking versions of my car as it is, uh, you know, will be this year. Not quite yet, but once it's finished with paint and everything. So that has not been an easy journey. Let me tell you, the fiberglass is now, you know, flowing through my, my veins and I, I've got it just in my arms and in my hair. I'm constantly itchy, but that's um, called cancer. Yeah. <laughs> so, to, so, so, Speaking on that, you know, it takes a lot of time, and that's really time and perseverance is, is the one of my best qualities, I think, that, uh, that I've gone after with this car and learning how to do over the, the years. You know, maintaining a car that's all fiberglass is not easy. It's not supposed to be. Um, you know, the Japanese spend a lot of time getting their cars to look that good, and I try to take cues from that, and you know, just, you gotta, you gotta work it out long, long nights in the shop. You gotta learn how to, how to work it, and then sometimes you just gotta just go for it. So learning fiberglass in the beginning for me was not easy, but um, I watched a couple of YouTube videos, asked a couple of friends in the body shops that, you know, kind of for some advice, and then just went for it. I bought the materials and tried it out. I can't just stress enough about how you have to spend a lot of time in the shop and just dedication on working on it and making it right. Uh, going Before you go on on that, how many hours do you have into this specific car to keep it going all these years? Oh my gosh. Um, literally thousands of hours. Uh, if we're just talking man hours, I've spent, you know, tons of time in lots of different shops for many different years. Uh, phew, get that mosquito out of here. For many different years working on it. I mean, I would say on average, I spend in the off season, maybe 25 to 40 hours a week, depending on how much workload I have that week. Uh, that's on top of, you know, a, a full-time job and balancing home life and you know doing laundry and cleaning your own room and stuff. Uh, so add that up and then you know sometimes you have friends help you. So there have been lots of times when I've had friends come and help me and if, if I've got one friend that's double the man hours if I've got three or four friends helping with the motor swap over the weekend or whatever, you kind of have to account for you know that many man hours. So it turns into a hundred man hours over uh, you know two days real quickly. Um, I have spent, you know, many nights not sleeping trying to get the car ready for events. That's just part of it. You have to be willing to do that. If you don't really want it, you're not going to make it. So, uh, especially when you have problems in the 11th hour, you just got to push through. I've gone weekends where I literally blew up three engines, uh, three 2Js, unfortunately for me, 
in one 36 hour period. Uh, the first one blew up tuning it. The second one blew up uh, just kind of starting it and driving it around the neighborhood. The third one I put in and I just loaded it on the trailer. I drove straight to the event and literally on the first lap, halfway through the first lap, it blew up. So I got a half a lap for three motors and I just got no sleep that weekend. I completely crushed my bank account. It was really unfortunate, really not, not fun time. And I'm still here. So you have to kind of be able to push past that and look, look, you know, look at the brighter side and remember the times that are really enjoyable about this sport. And then just kind of, you know, find out how to make the money to do it again and then go do it. And you can't look at, look too far back in the past. So, um, taking all of the skills that I've learned from this car and from um, networking and managing my own program and everything, I've been able to kind of apply that to real life. So, uh, networking is is definitely a huge part of it. You know, I met uh, the owner of the Rally Ranch, Dave, at a drift event. Actually, he was out testing for his Pikes Peak hill climb. We just kind of BS'd around and um, kind of you know told some jokes about each other or whatever and then here I am a couple years later uh, and I'm the lead instructor at the rally ranch so that worked out really well for me I uh, was invited to come and check it out one day by day he just said come and come drive a Honda Civic in the field and I was like that sounds boring and then I got out there and he showed me some of these really cool techniques that rally drivers use that is unlike any other form of driving and I really just fell in love with the car control aspect of it that to me is what kind of turns me on about driving a car it's just controlling the car and, and learning how to control something that is out of control. You know, drifting is not supposed to be easy, so um, it's all about controlling the beast. That's why, you know, the Japanese oftentimes have kind of lackluster setups or, or maybe not the optimal setup for what you might think uh, compared to like a Formula D car here in America. The FD cars are supposed to be very easy to drive and very fast, whereas the cars over there are supposed to be very cool and stylish or like the Ebisu model which is you know how many laps can I take those cars it doesn't really matter what they look like it doesn't really matter uh, how fast they are all that matters is that they can take lap after lap after lap hundreds of laps for the optimum fun so a couple different models to follow I like to follow you know the performance and kind of aesthetics com combination so my car is not built such that it is purely for performance or function it is always going to have form in mind. So I want to try and not raise it up too much, you know, even though when you raise the car up, it does handle a little better. I've gotten to where it's kind of a nice balance. Um, I still keep a, a low body kit on it. I still, you know, want it to be painted, not um, wrapped with some dorky looking wrap or something like that. Uh, some wraps are fine, but oftentimes you get them and they're kind of matte and, and wrinkly and don't look that good. Are you ever jealous of the Ebisu model when I've got the Mustang out there and I do 200 laps? <laughs> I'm definitely jealous of that part. How many laps do you get compared to me at a oh, normal round? Oh, it's a fraction. It's just a fraction. Of How many laps do you normally take? I mean, I usually burn up uh, between 8 and 10 kendas and I probably do... I go through 6 to 8. 50 laps. Maybe. That's a lot of laps, though. That's a lot Not of laps really. for an aggressive car. How many laps do I typically get? I mean, over 100, easily. So I'm doing more than double to triple? More than double, for half the tires. Who does more yeah. maintenance on the car? Oh, I do, for sure. How many hours of maintenance per yeah. year maintenance <clears throat> for my maintenance kind of thing? I don't even think you do any maintenance. I don't. So. I don't do any. <laughs> yeah. I think, so what do you think? Uh, I think I do probably um, between 30 and 50 hours. Per round? Per round. I don't unload the car. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I have to. My just, car doesn't come out of the trailer. Uh, okay, I'm going to let you go. Yeah. I just wanted to shove that in there because like, we're very different on that mm -hmm, model. Mm -hmm. I don't even drive cars with fiberglass, and I still have them, but I don't dare take them yeah. out. So like, I just people don't understand when he's talking about this how much time really is spent to have a fairly clean car. Mm -hmm. And you're still driving a car that's super beat up by round three or four in the season. Oh, easily, yeah. You would, how many hours would it take... It would take astronomically more hours yeah, to keep I, it clean every event. If I were to prep it like I do for round one between every event, it would be over 100 hours probably. Uh, That's if wild. I were to drive it as hard as I do. Now, there's the other part of it. You know, Do you want to drive as hard as you should to try and win or you know, try and put on a great show or really get that, that excitement and that adrenaline out of your event? Um, some people choose to dial it back to seven tenths and then not have to fix their car in between rounds. Um, I don't like to do that. I like to really be able to kind of unleash. I drive like a grandpa every day on the streets in a normal car. So when I'm on the track, that's when I really get to kind of unleash and, and really get my adrenaline going. 
And that's what I enjoy about it. So I, I understand when I'm on track that there is always a chance to wreck and that there will be, you know, hours and hours of, of painful maintenance, boring, mundane stuff behind the scenes uh, in between rounds. So uh, it does get really frustrating when someone in front of me makes a stupid mistake and then I crash into them or I make a stupid mistake and crash myself and I get really pissed at myself. And, you know, it kind of ruins me my day for the next couple hours. And then I get over it and uh, just have a good time with the rest of the guys if I can keep driving. Okay. To get you back on subject, you did rally school driving now, mm -hmm. which you've segued into. Yep. Because of your high level of skill in driving and drifting and stuff, you segued into rally stuff really well. You met the rally school owner mm -hmm. through drifting and through cars. I did. You segued into that. What's your other thing? Okay. So that's one job. Yeah. The second job you have is you build Indy cars. Kind of. So Kind of. I'll, I'll talk about that. All so, right. Tell us about that real quick. I'll tell you how I got that gig. So I was working at rally school. I was also picking up other jobs, driving other things. So I was hired to drive the Tito's party bus, which was cool. Uh, I was hired by a friend, Julian, who um, it's also someone I've met in cars or, or the car world, drifting or whatever you want to say. I was driving the Tito's party bus to go pick up some Tito's merch and I happened to see this bay door open with some really sweet cars inside. So I kind of like popped my head in and was like looking at all these cars and then some guy popped his head up from behind one of them and I was like, is that a March 87C Indy car? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, and that's a Lotus Evora GT2? And he's like, yeah. And I was just like, holy crap. And he goes, come in here. So we just started bullshitting and um, talking back and forth and I gave him my information and he just, you know, was a interesting guy who was working on these cars I didn't know much about. Fast forward a few months later, he asked if I wanted to get a job there and I said, yeah, of course, what do I have to do? And he said, just help me build and maintain these cars. So there's one guy who's got this really cool race car collection and me and a couple other guys just build and maintain them and take them to the track for him. So that kind of segued from, you know, another driving gig, another car related gig. And now that's what I, I do. I'm on a, a team. We build some vintage race cars. We've got a 1997 Benetton F1 car, which is really, really crazy car. This is when, you know, Aero, the Aero was starting to become developed and they have some really insane engines. It's got a Cosworth V8 in it. And then he's also got Michael Andretti's old Craco 87C IndyCar, which is a turbocharged V8. It makes about a thousand horsepower. It weighs about 1600 pounds, I think. Um, you know, gigantic slicks on the back and it sounds insane. And I'm working on it beside a couple other mechanics uh, every day. And that has been something that really has opened my eyes to the world of real racing. It's, it's been really cool to learn all these different kind of techniques and technologies and, and build ideas that they use on their cars and kind of implement that on my car in, in little, you know, s small ways. I can't, I can't afford a lot of the stuff that they do, but I can also, I can take the, the processes that they use and then implement them in my car to make it a little more reliable. So to be very clear, you segued into both of those jobs because of your drifting. Yeah. You learned to work on cars through mm -hmm. drifting. You learned to weld, you learned to work on them, you learned to troubleshoot them, you learned all the skills necessary to do that. Yep. So you got a job as a fabricator and a mechanic. Mm -hmm. Do you fabricate? That's actually my, my department. Okay. I fabricate so he, he and then fabricates, I'm not much of a mechanic, I'm much more of a fabricator. He fabricates <laughs> on the cars and he also does rally school driving mm -hmm. stuff. So everything you learned basically in drifting has transitioned over pretty well. Yeah. Are yeah. you happy with that? Do you see yeah, a future I mean, in that or do you um, just like, you're like going to go be a realtor soon? <laughs> no, I don't like, I think that I've kind of developed my skill set into such a, a niche market, but luckily there is a demand for it. So what's the future? Um, I just want to keep having fun. Honestly, I, I think, uh, I don't, I don't want to dwell too much on like a real concrete plan that may sound ignorant, but, uh, I just want to be able to continue to enjoy myself and enjoy what I'm doing and keep being able to drive. So yeah. I do all of these things so that I can drive. I work at the rally school specifically so that, you know, um, I can continue to drive, not only with some income, but also being able to drive rally cars keeps me sharp in the off season. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything else to talk about? No, I just... I just think um, that what makes you special specifically is 
you've transitioned into your professional career where you don't have a normal job outside of racing. Right. So you instruct and you also fabricate. Mm -hmm. Both of those things round you out for things that you um, gain the knowledge through drifting and right. through your love of cars. So you've transitioned and branched out, but you still have a core like love of drifting. Yeah, you're you own a drift car, obviously not a rally car, mm -hmm. but that's because Dave won't give you a <laughs> drift car to drive. No, I'm still most passionate about drifting. Yeah. Honestly, I, I I don't watch rally religiously on TV. I don't follow every single driver. I don't know every rule. Thing. It's two weeks to round one. Yeah. Fielding still has to paint the car. Still has to finish and the car it. and do the timing oh, of the water God. pump and finish the cooling to system. To tell you the truth, you're not as far behind as normal. And put no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm a, I've got a jump on the on the game. Yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got some good help too. All right.